So would you, would you let's, let's all find your spot. Would you just hold your, your Bible in your hand and we're going to just pray. Pray that it would change our lives as we share together. We ask as we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. January 2020, sorry, 1 verse 1. Now again, Jesus chose 12 disciples. And uh, they were not meant to just be his little posse that just stayed and hung together and says, boy, did we ever have a good time when Jesus was walking with us, but now what do we do? But John was one of those disciples, and all of these men, with the exception of Judas, and we know that God will judge him more fairly and justly, to go into all the world, to be the authentic witnesses of what he had influence over. And this is what he said. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have Um, just so you'll know, uh, over this next couple of weeks, we're going to be having three different views of evangelism. Perspective, and then the following week, Danny Jones uh, from the um, sorry from the millennial perspective. Danny Hunt is the millennial. Danny Jones is the Gen X. So sorry about that. Boy, I'm having a hard time. I keep putting my tongue over my eye teeth and I can't see what I'm saying. Anyways. <laughs> or my father used to talk about uh, wanting to get me uh, peppermint-flavored shoes because my foot was in my mouth so often. <laughs> Anyways, we'll move on. What we see here is that a witness, a witness is someone who has seen something or someone who has experienced. Seeing hot and somebody got all excited and went running to tell King David what had happened. And so King David said, well, what happened? He says, well, I don't know. There was a bunch of confusion. And they had to wait for the next runner came and was able to give a fuller account. Lose sight of what we're called to do. We are called to be authentic witnesses. And so John writes, he says, that which was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have looked at in our hands of touch. So there was experience behind this. Now, again, as we talk our way through this, every single person has to come to faith for himself or herself. That you're not kind of grandfathered in, but you need to have a personal relationship. And so to be an authentic witness means you must have experienced and seen something. Now, one of the concerns that I have about any time we talk about evangelism is that it's very easy to make that complicated. So I grew up during a time, and this is my baby boomer perspective, 
of, of standing out on street corners or being given tracks. And I went with my grandfather and my dad's dad that every Saturday that I was there, that he would go down to the train station. Yes, the train station. And he would fill and whatever. And it was interesting, last year, Lottie and I, we happened to be holidaying in, in Southwest Florida. And it's been a long time since I've been in that culture. Um, you know, and I remember, so we, we went to, I went to the, the men's bathroom, and there on the counter was Instead of it being something that was personal, it began to be an activity. Um, the same time I was, that churches would offer evangelism classes. And so, you know, there was the four spiritual laws, and then it would come up with things like 10 steps to leading someone to Jesus. The challenge is that if you go through it like that, what happens when somebody doesn't go through the 10 steps? Like, oh my goodness, they just... So through this season, and one of the reasons I'm excited about Alpha is because it's going to teach us not information, but it's going... that we've had with Jesus Christ. It's not a formula. It's not a process. But it is the experience with Jesus Christ. So then we see And again, a very cosmopolitan world center. And it's interesting, though Paul was very, very learned, and we know that. We see that in the book of Acts, where he would have conversations about faith. But it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we see that Paul, because he was addressing an audience that didn't have a lot of religious understanding, he says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with elders. The testimony is, again, something, it's a, it's a statement, it's a testimony. It says, experience. And it says this, for I resolved, that's a conscious choice, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ. My message and my preaching were not with wise and pervasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on you. My experience of, of witnessing and, and evangelism, that it was a very process-driven thing that we engaged with as, as Christians. I began to think, wow, we need to think more about this. What does it look like to be an authentic witness of Jesus Christ? Again, we see We see that in the book of Acts, it says that people saw these men that had spent time with Jesus, and it says that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. They said, are these not... We see them doing these things. We hear them speaking in other languages, and they have this wisdom that is not learned in some sort of book or educational institution. But it was something that they were. <coughs> Did you see that?
Now, it's interesting. We get this in the non-churched world. Man, did you see that game last night? It was awesome. Or not so much. Lottery. No, I didn't. But let's just use that. Or I just got this new car, or we just bought this new house, or hey, we just got back from this incredible holiday. We want to share out of the fullness of our heart good things that are happening. And yet somehow I think that we as a church, I as an individual, as a Christian, sometimes I get disconnected from these things that I've experienced that have brought me great joy and happiness or were exciting. And somehow I say nothing about that when it comes to Jesus Christ. Are you glad somebody shared with you? I am. This, one of the things that it's, we have that our moniker is in, into the marketplace, and it makes no sense until we really phrase it like this, out of the upper. Basically, what happened was Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you unempowered. I'm going to send to you my Holy Spirit, and he will teach you of me, and he will empower you. Now, again, what I'm, I'm, I'm always grateful when people give me information and the skills needed to do what I'm being asked to do. Nothing is more frustrating. Or the power to do that. Jesus said, I'm going to send you out into the world. Unapologetic about the fact that we believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we see in the book Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you received the Holy Spirit, but that there is a second empowering experience that takes place that we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the release of the Holy Spirit. Whatever word you want to use, all I know is that God wants to come and he wants to change and transform you and me into people who have power to show his goodness and his glory and that he really is the Son of God. And so, again, the longer we're Christians, the easier it is for us to lose track of that. And so, again, when I went into that, that um, hospital room last night, I said to Caleb, he was laying there on the, on the bed with his grandparents who were believers, and I just looked at him, and I said, Caleb, I said, I'm here because I believe in miracles. I'm not going to just pray the pastoral prayer but we're going to believe God for a miracle. I'm going to put my hand on you. We're going to believe that God's going to touch you. See, that's... Not because I did it, but it's saying, this is what it looks like. And so sometimes we as Christians and we as pastors, we talk about things and we just expect for people who are where you are to just understand what we're saying. We say, go be an authentic witness. And somebody says, well, I want to do that, but what does that look like? We know what that looks like. That looks like what we were talking about last week, about people who are asking the Jesus question. We have the answer. It doesn't look like getting on your soapbox. It doesn't pulling out your, your four spiritual laws. It's about sharing. Your life is better, and how even though there are difficulties and hardships, you're not on your own anymore, but you've got a, 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 a person in the, in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came, and he's come into your life, and he's made a difference. We see examples of that in the, in the Gospel of John, same guy who wrote this, the letter that we started with, was the one who shared the Gospel according to John, and it was the woman at the well, and she had all of these questions, and Jesus just did not allow her to say. What, what are we going to do? And Jesus cut through all of that, and he says, the Father is looking for people who 
people will worship him in spirit and in truth. And it says that that woman went away and she shared it. She was an authentic witness. She had experienced something that And they, they came to him, the religious leader says, what happened? He says, all I know is I met this guy. And I love what the guy said through the scriptures. He says, look, I don't know whether it's good or bad. All I know is once I was blind and now I can see. So that's the other part of this, that in this whole idea about evangelism, we think we've got to have information. What we need is relationship. Well, what do you think? Of, I don't know. All I know is once I was blind, now I can see. All I know is once my life was broken, it wasn't working, and I went to bed at night, and I couldn't sleep, and I was worried about this, and I was worried about that, and, and, and just I was in constant turmoil. And Jesus intersected my life, and my life is forever different. is not meant to be a verb. It's meant to be a noun that you are the way. Now, do I think there's a place for apologetics? Absolutely. Do I believe there's a place for, for study? Absolutely. Do I believe that there's a place for some people to be able to understand? It doesn't go to the heart. Friend of mine who's a Roman Catholic priest. Relationship with Jesus Christ. So I am called to be an authentic witness in the midst of the church, because for us, the church of people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but for him, he's talking about a group of people. I want to show people through my life that Jesus is real. And they poured out. They didn't stay. And this is one of my greatest concerns about the church in its current configuration, not our church specifically, but just the church in general, is that unfortunately we have made it into an activity all too often. It becomes a place. We in our cloistered little church buildings and we pray for one another and we make sure that everybody's okay and we miss the people who are out there. We don't have the things that, that, that break Jesus' heart on our heart. So I'll give you an example. And again, I, I, I'm just giving this example. This week I was on my way out from working out at the gym before I come up, come up, here, come up here in the morning and there was this guy, and, you know, he was underneath, uh, you know, the, the roof there, and he had his hand in his pocket, he had a hoodie up, and, and um, so anyways, I had my gym bag, and it, I was, quote, late, and I went to my car, and, and um, I was starting up the car, and then the Lord just really nudged me and says, you know, you remember that story of the Good Samaritan? Back, and I said, and I didn't say, do you know Jesus? But I said, are you okay? I said, have you eaten today? Is there anything I can do for you? No, that's fine. Tim, I'm just saying that 
it's easy for me to just walk past human need and not be an authentic witness. And it's not just about what happens in the four walls of this place, but it's about being his authentic witness. And so to quote my good friend and mentor, Jerry Cook, Jerry, he is authentic witness. And so what happened was that the, the disciples and those in the upper room, they poured out of the upper room and they went out into the marketplace. And if you read in Acts 2, verse 12, that the people says, what does all this? about church growth. Church growth is about one person who doesn't know Jesus coming to Jesus for the first time. I get nervous about where we begin to package churches as, as just another experience. Let me tell you something that needs Jesus more than it's ever needed it before or for a long time. And that people don't know Jesus. They don't know the reality of Jesus. They know about him. They, they know what they've learned through the media. They, they see what, what happens when people are not necessarily walking in love. But evangelism is about being an authentic witness. It's about touching a world that needs Jesus. And all I know is that I have come to the conclusion that people are highly resistant to churchianity, but they're not resistant to people who will give them answers to life's problems. And that's, again, what Alpha is all about. So they poured out of the, market, out of the upper room and into the marketplace. So then it occurred to me, I was sitting there this morning, into the marketplace, and what does that mean? read the blog this morning, I was going through all of this, and it occurred to me that, that that's a church, churchy, churchy word. It's a Christianese kind of word. Well, we got to go out into the... Um, it, it took me to the, the Roman Forum or the Greek Agora. And so the Roman Forum, it still exists, although it's in ruins now. People went to buy stuff. It was where people went to exchange. It was where people went to socialize. It was where, you know, the arts took place. It was just the, the hub of and the heartbeat of that. when we've gone to places in Mexico, and I, when we take groups of teenagers and uh, people to Mexico, we say, hey, every place has a central. And we'll point out, oh, look, there's the central. Just the re remainder of this whole idea of the forum, and so it's a place where people would gather. So in my hometown, on Worcester Avenue and 3rd, there, there were four corners of, uh, all four corners, and that was the city center. It was a gathering place. And then when the mall became the mall, you know, it used to be you go downtown. That was the marketplace. Well, now, now people go to the mall. And... want to be a part of something. They want to be wherever you go where other people are. And so again, when I was growing up, people would go door to door and and it had fruit. And you know, you all if you've been, if you have a house, you'll know that, you know, occasionally you'll have people from the Church of the Latter-day Saints coming and knocking at your door, the Jehovah.
door to door with a tract or with a Bible or trying to debate people, that actually in lots of places does more bad than good. Because marketplace, the marketplace is wherever you are, where you go, it's your workplace, it's at the soccer practice on the soccer field, it's at the gym, it's at, it's, it's at the grocery store, it's in your neighborhood. So out of the upper room where we're all blessed and into the marketplace, that's what evangelism is. So I want to just say this, that it, it, it looks like this, that evangelism is, it morphs from going to a meeting to meeting with people. So church is not a destination. church, we go to meet with the church. That's how ridiculous it is. We don't go to meet with the church as a building, but we go to encourage one another, and that's the whole thing that Jerry Cook began to talk to us about, that find out about Jesus. But church is that place where we come to be encouraged so that we understand that the, the, the real purpose and the real activity of the church is being authentic witnesses to people who are desperate for love and understanding and healing and encouragement and courage. How would I explain evangelism? Evangelism is simply a person who has a relationship with Jesus in you. And so, you know what? I can be as dumb as a sack of hammers. I really can. And like I said, you know, but what I find is when I start to really grasp that evangelism isn't an activity, but it's the outflow of a relationship, everything changes. And it's not a, well, I witnessed to 20 people today. But it's not being checked off. It's about sharing. Talk about my grandfather. I've, some of you heard this story before. My dad's dad had a great ed, grade eight education, and by today's standards, he would be what I would call a functional illiterate. Smart, plenty smart. Whatever, but he just really had a hard time reading and comprehending or whatever. One time I said to him, I said, Grandpa, how many, how many, you know, how many people have you witnessed to in your life? Because I just saw wherever he was, he was just being an authentic witness. He worked harder, he helped people, he prayed with people, he wasn't sophisticated in his arguments. Arithmetic. He said, I gave my heart to Jesus in 1930, blank, 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 blank. And I promised Jesus that I would I would share my testimony. And sheet metal worker, functional illiterate, at his funeral, person after person walked past the casket and said, "He led me to Jesus. He he introduced me to Jesus." He introduced me to Jesus. He introduced me to Jesus. Including the pastor of the church that they attended the last few years of his life. It was his boss. And Grandpa said, yeah, I'd take time to 
share my, my life with people, and then I would keep track of how much time I spent, and I would always make sure that however long I was sharing with someone, I made sure that I got my full, my full eight hours in. So sometimes he'd be home late for work, and you all, know, well, Grandpa must have been sharing Jesus. Think about this. When you hear about the activity of, quote, this thing called the church, the organized church, if, would you agree with me that we don't always show up as, as, a, as the church, this entity called the church? That it just breaks my heart because we sure aren't purveyors of good news. We are often just... Does it break your heart? I watch, and you know, this person did this, or this person, or this pastor, or this, this local assembly did this, or the Church of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I was talking with somebody a few years ago, and says, well, God hates me. And I says, well, why do you think that? He says, well, because it's what the church told me. Because we don't separate behavior from personhood. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So the gospel is always the good news, and I'll say this way, if it ain't the good news, it ain't the gospel. So then I close with this last thing. I was reading this book when I was a young pastor. That's a pretty big name. How would you like to go through your life? My name is John R.W. Stott. Probably got called John at home, who knows, but. Anyways, it was revela revelation for me. He said that we need to separate. There's two processes. We lump evangelism with conversion, and that's what makes it so hard. He said our role, our job, our part is just to share the good news. With that person right there, you didn't have them fill out their decision card. If you didn't give them a track, you didn't give them a People stopped sharing the good news is because they felt the sense of failure because they were taking upon themselves something that was never theirs to carry. Our role is to share. So if I share the good news with somebody, whether they accept Jesus or not, at that point in time, did you know it takes 10 clear My role says to share. You talk, I've heard you I've shared with you about my friend Gil and how nine months after I met him, he gave his heart to Jesus. But the very first conversation I had with Gil over a cup of coffee when we were sharing about what we do, he says, well, what do you do? He says, well, I pastor a church. He says, are you one of those born-again people? My antenna went up and says, oh, this guy, somebody's talked to him about something. Somebody had sown seeds, and I just happened to be there to be able to reap the harvest. Part is conversion. Only Jesus can change a life. I don't want people being converted to Sunshine Hills Church, God forbid. I don't want people being converted to a set of rules and regulations, God forbid, or behavior modification. But let me let me say this that when Act, you have your act all together, and you know, sometimes people, when they first come to Christ, they still have a potty mouth, and God knows that, or they're still involved in some behavior that is not something that God would condone because it's destructive, not because God's shocked. The reason God gives us direction is because he loves us. But all I know is that they say things like, once I was lost, and now I'm found. Once I was blind, and now I can see. My life wasn't working, and Jesus intersected my life. We saw that this morning, testimony to this lovely young woman who somebody invited to come to a youth activity. So I was talking out in the lobby there, and 
And um, says, oh, yeah, I, I, I've been around for a while, but this, I just started coming on Sunday. He said, oh, good, I'm so glad you're here. Somebody invited me. But somebody didn't say, come to Jesus. Somebody just said, come over. We're going to do this and beginning to see what was happening. And I look at some of you in this row who... invited you. And we saw you guys get water baptized. Like I said, sometimes I can be as dumb as a sack of hammers, and I just think everybody kind of knows what they're supposed to do. So what? And now what? They need hope. They need Jesus. They need they need peace in the midst of turmoil. Now, now what? I'm asking each one of us to take responsibility to be what Jesus wants us to be and just not do witnessing, but to be a witness. Does that make sense? That's what I'm asking. So Lord, just help us, God, again. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would When people are asking the Jesus question, that we're going to be quick to be able to do that in a way that's life-giving. All I know is once I was blind and now I can see. Or if we're in a situation where we're not going to argue people into the kingdom. We have to see them come to a personal relationship with you. Help us as a church to do that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Would you maybe this is your first Sunday here, or maybe you've been here countless times, but you've never made a personal decision to receive Jesus as your Savior, that he died on the cross for you, that he rose to show that he was God and that he wants to be in your life and help. right where you are, and if this is your first time or you've been here countless times, but you've never answered the question, is who is Jesus going to be to me? Right where you are, you can raise your hand. I'd love a chance to pray with you. So Pastor Tom, by raising my hand, I'm saying, I want, to, I want to invite this Jesus that you've talked about into my life to be my personal Savior. Is anybody? growing up the way I did, that there just seemed to be an awful lot of guilt and condemnation because I wasn't sharing my faith. Father, that you would release us from guilt and obligation and that we can just do exactly what John said, that which we have seen and heard and touched concerning the world. Everybody said, Amen. You want to stand with me? If you're new, you can go downstairs. We have a coffee shop. You can get a free, free nice, especially coffee. There's a bunch of stuff to sign up for.